بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're still in the chapter that deals with Eid and hadith number 143 was narrated by Jundub ibn Abdullah al-Bajali may Allah be pleased with him he said that on the day of Nahr, on the day of sacrifice, that is the 10th of the Hijjah, the Prophet وسلم, offered the prayer and delivered the khutbah and then slaughtered the sacrifice and said, anybody who slaughtered his sacrifice before the Eid prayer should slaughter another animal in place of it and the one who has not yet slaughtered should slaughter mentioning Allah's name on it. Again, this hadith is similar to the previous hadith of Al-Bara' ibn Azib, but here it is something extra. In hadith of Bara' ibn Azib, the Prophet ﷺ said, after you pray, you slaughter. But here he prayed, then offered the khutbah, then slaughtered. And that is why some of the scholars said that it is essential that you do not slaughter except after the khutbah. However, other scholars said that you can slaughter after the prayer because this is what the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib clearly states. And to be on the safe side, it's only a matter of half an hour, approximately even less. Therefore, it is highly recommended that you do not slaughter except after the conclusion, after the end of the khutbah of Al-Eid. Now, a lot of the non-Muslims consider slaughtering to be a barbaric act. And we as Muslims do not care about what they think. We know that this religion is from the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's from Allah Azza wa Jal and that Allah the Almighty knows what is best to his servants. And we also know that medical reports clearly state that when an animal is slaughtered, all the blood that contains the bacteria and the microbes and all means of illnesses and diseases, when the animal is slaughtered, the body is dried from the majority of this blood and hence maintains the meat to be more tender, more delicious, and above all, healthier. And that is why Islam recommends us to slaughter. Not only recommends us, we cannot eat any animal that it is not slaughtered. Unless, of course, it is hunted. And this, there are different set of rules for a hunted animal. But other than animals to be slaughtered, we're not allowed to eat them. Maybe they would say, we stun an animal. We hit the animal on the head until it dies. We suffocate an animal. We electrocute an animal until it dies, and then we slaughter it. Well, if you do this, you will find that the blood that comes out is negligible compared to the blood that comes out when you slaughter. And besides, this is inhumane. The amount of pain and suffering that the animal gets is far less when the animal is being slaughtered. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah the Almighty has mandated to be kind on everything. And therefore, if you slaughter, be kind when you slaughter. And you must sharpen your knife, your blade, and you must lay your slaughtered animal to rest quickly. All of this is a type of Islamic etiquette to those who claim that we are barbaric. In Islam, it is forbidden for you to slaughter a sheep or an animal in front of other animals. Do you know that? You cannot slaughter a sheep while other sheep are looking in Islam. Look at those who have slaughterhouses in the non-Muslim countries. 
they slaughter the hundreds and the thousands while they're looking at each other. This is inhumane. And therefore, we could care less about what people say about us. Because we are Muslims, we've submitted our will to Allah Azza wa Jal, and we are complying to His teachings, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. We have hadith number 144. This hadith is a long one, and we'd like someone to read it for us. Uh, yes, Arshi. Jabir ibn Abdullah reported, I observed prayer with Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Eid day. He commenced with a prayer before the khutbah without adhan and without ihkama. He then stood up leaning on Bilal and he commanded them to have taqwa, consciousness of Allah, and he exhorted them on obedience to him. And he preached to the people and admonished them. He then walked on until he came to the women and preached to them and said, O women, give charity, for you will be most of the fuel for the fire. A woman having a dark spot on her cheek stood up and said, Why is it so, Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, For you complain too much and show ingratitude to your spouse. And then they begin to give charity out of their ornaments, such as their earrings and rings which they threw on the cloth of Bilal. Bukhari and Muslim. Zakallah khair. In this hadith, we learn that it is not part of the sunnah to have an adhan or an iqamah for Eid. And hence, it is not permissible to call people for Eid by saying, As salatu jami'ah or salatul Eidi athabakumullah, as being done in some places because all of this is considered to be innovation. The Prophet didn't do it, alayhi salatu salam. So, how dare you do something that the Prophet did not do? Also, the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam's khutbah and sermon of Eid would consist of preaching the people, reminding them of Allah Azza wa Jal, and drawing them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, the Prophet والسلام, would go to the women and address them specifically rather than addressing them with the men because he have already addressed the men and the women. But then he goes specifically for the women and he would remind them of Allah Azza wa Jal. And as you heard in the hadith, he told them that you must pay charity because the majority of you would be the fuel, wood of fire. And the women, may Allah be pleased with them, the companions, one of them stood up and said, okay, this is not normal. We do not disbelieve in Allah. So why is it so? And she stood up and said, why is that, O Prophet of Allah? Now, you've told us about the punishment, can you kindly tell us about the sin? And the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, that you complain a lot and you're not grateful and you do not show gratitude to your spouse. So these are two reasons for women to be thrown into hell. And one would maybe object and say, okay, isn't this also found in men? Don't we have men who complain a lot? Don't we have men who are ungrateful to their wives? The answer is yes, definitely we do. However, the responsibilities of women are far less than the responsibilities of men. Men are obliged to be the bread earner. They're obliged to go out and work. They're obliged to pray in the masjid five times a day. They're obliged to do jihad when it is required and requested. They're obliged to attend so many things, not like the women. Women, as in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, if a woman fasts her month, that is Ramadan, and prays her prayer, that is the five daily prayers, and protects her chastity. She does not fornicate, she does not 
uh, flirt or go uh, fool around. And she obeys her husband. Four things. What would happen? The Prophet says she will enter Allah's paradise. Now this is a great reward for what? For only four simple things. So we men believe. Though if you put yourself in the women's shoes, obeying the husband is not an easy task. It is an enormous responsibility, especially if the husband is not someone you would love to obey. If the husband is arrogant, if the husband is ignorant, if he's ugly, if he stinks, if he, his mouth smell is awful, if, his, if your in-laws are bad, this makes life more and more difficult. But yet, the responsibilities are less. A woman sits home, she's the queen of the house, everything comes to her on her request. So if she complains, this means that she is not grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal, nor she is grateful to her husband. We have a short break, and inshallah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So, women complain. Women show feelings of being ungrateful and feelings of not being thankful to what the husbands do. This is a major sin. And this is one of the main reasons of entering hell. But if women claim and complain that this is our nature. We can't do anything about it. In this case, Allah knows the truth. And in this case, the Prophet ﷺ has directed you to do what erases some of these sins. And that is paying charity. And Allah Azza wa Jal also revealed an ayah where he says that verily the good deeds erase the bad deeds. Inna al-hasanati we learn if women have shortcomings, they have to compensate by night prayer, by offering sadaqah. And of course, the best thing to do is to tolerate. You must tolerate your husband. You must cope with what he has. You must be grateful to the least of what he's presenting because the companions, their wives, whenever they wanted to go out, to earn money, their wives used to tell them, fear Allah in us, because we can tolerate hunger, but we cannot tolerate haram money. We are ready to be patient and not to eat a lot, but we're not ready to eat something that is haram, that would take us to hell. From this hadith, we learn that it is permissible to dedicate a sermon for the females and this was requested by the females at the time of the Prophet when they said O Prophet of Allah the men have overwhelmed you and took you from us so designate one day a week where you come to us or we come to you and we learn from you and this shows how careful they were in learning from the Prophet From this hadith, we also learn that women used to go out to attend the sermon and the prayer of Eid. And it is unlike praying in the masjid. We've stated before that praying in the masjid for women is not recommended. It is more recommended for them to pray in their homes. Unlike Eid. Eid, it is highly recommended for them to go out and some scholars even went further to say it is mandatory for them to go out and attend the Eid as we will know inshallah later on. From this hadith as also that the Sunnah for women to be segregated from men. So the women were far away from the men. They were not mixing together. And one of the most shocking and ridiculous piece of news that I've heard in the past few years where a woman led the prayer of Friday. She was the Friday Imam in America. And in America, everything that is weird happens. Everything you would think of happens in America. But this was the funniest and the most stupid because it was unprecedented 
It never happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It never happened at the time of the Muslims. 15 centuries never to happen. Where a woman leads the Friday prayer and gives a sermon. And the Mu'adhin, I saw that on the YouTube, was so funny because she was not even wearing the veil. She was a woman. And in the prayer you saw women and men praying next to each other. Women in their jeans and men next to them. What kind of prayer is this? This is almost close to being an orgy rather than being a Friday prayer. This is ridiculous. This is playing with religion and it can reach the stage of nullifying a person's religion if he thinks he can play with Islam like this. This goes against the ijma of the Muslims. The way of life, the way of the companions, it showed that the Prophet ﷺ promoted segregation between men and women. Women have their own society. They can do whatever they want. But once a man and a woman mix together, the inevitable must happen. And we all know what happened. And they say, no, once they get used to it, it becomes okay and normal. And this is only in the minds of you Muslims. Well, I beg to differ. We all know what one of the presidents of a superpower did with an intern. And we know what he had done with her because she was working with him. And he was married and he's married, he has children. And he did what was known to be one of the biggest scandals in the history of America. President with an entrance. Why? Because of the mixing. This is what Islam protects the women and men. Segregation for the better and for the best for the society. We also learn from the hadith that the companions, whether men or women, were so quick to respond to the Prophet's call The minute they learned that they will be in hell because of their sins and the Prophet encouraged them to give sadaqah, none of them said, okay, I'll give you a rain check or wait until I go back and get my credit cards or I will try to sell. No, immediately whatever they had, they gave it for Allah and they started throwing their jewelry to Bilal who was collecting this for sadaqah. And finally, we learned from this hadith, the ruling on piercing the ear. Because some scholars said that piercing the ear so that you would wear, not you of course men, so that women would wear earrings, they said that this is torture and it is not permissible and this is incorrect. Whatever means a woman needs to beautify herself, which is known among the Muslims, it is permissible and since the time of the Prophet ﷺ, women used to wear earrings and they used to pierce their ears for that. What's the ruling on piercing another piercing for having two earrings or three earrings? The scholars say that this is permissible. Though it is not known to be part of women uh, wearing jewelry except recently when the women in the West started piercing two or three. But they say again, as long as this is normal practice among the Muslims, it's permissible. What's the ruling on piercing the nose? If the customs of the Muslims state that this is form of beautification, it is permissible, though it is not recommended. And now piercing other parts of the body is completely prohibited. So someone says, what's the ruling on piercing my tongue or piercing my nipples or piercing my belly button or piercing the, all of this is un-Islamic and it's cause of torturing and mutilation that is uncalled for in Islam. Of course, to have men pierce themselves, it's even more forbidden. Piercing is only permitted for women. I believe that these are all the rules that we can get from this hadith. If you have any question, I believe we have few minutes left. Yes, brother. Salim Sheikh. John. The age that you stated for slaughtering of animals is the same to be followed for any other sacrifice other than the sacrifice of Eid al -Azha. Yes. These ages, they must be followed in sacrificing your hadi, for example. And as we know, the slaughtering is either for hadi, and this is done by a pilgrim. 
A person who's doing pilgrimage, he offers hadi. A person who's not going for hajj, he offers udhiyah. A person who makes a mistake and has to compensate for it by slaughtering, he slaughters a fidya. And a person who is blessed by Allah with a baby child, he slaughters aqiqa. And a person who gets married, he slaughters his walima. So these are the major five types of slaughtering in Islam. And it is recommended that it is mandatory for udhiyah, hadi, fidya, and aqiqa that they be more than six months old for a sheep, one year old for a goat, two years old for a cow, five years old for a camel. But for the walima, you can cook whatever you wish. It's food that is necessary. Yes. In the Indian subcontinent, uh, after the Eid namaz, the greeting is uh, done by hand, shaking hand, embracing. So what is the right way of uh, greeting uh, each other after Eid namaz? Are you talking about prayer of Eid? After the prayer of Eid, yeah. After yes. The, Eid, yeah. the Sunnah is, as reported in Muattal Imam Malik, that the companions, and I believe that it is reported by Jubair ibn Nufair, that the companion used to greet each other by saying, تَقَبَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنَّا وَمِنْكُمْ May Allah accept from us and you. So if the companions used to do this, the greeting itself is recommended and it is permissible. In Eid. However, the ruling on shaking hands after normal prayers, this is not recommended. Some countries, some places when you go, after Salam, concluding the prayer, you go to your right, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Even if you saw him and greeted him before Salah, you also do this. No, this is not part of the Sunnah. Yes, if there is someone you didn't see since a long time and you would like to greet him, yes. But someone you see every single prayer, five times a day, seven days a week, every prayer you shake hands with him, this becomes an innovation and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.